I do encourage you to take very, very seriously that form in your bulletin that you can fill out to help your new pastor uh, get to know you. Uh, I remember receiving those myself six years ago, and they really helped a lot. Uh, I still have that notebook full of stuff that you wrote to me uh, before I showed up that I received when I show up. It's very interesting to go back now and reread those and see how many of you told the truth. Um, particularly under that part about, you know, whatever else I want my pastor to know about me. Those are, those are interesting forms, but they're very helpful. I hope that you will, throughout the month of June, be filling those out. You can take those home, fill those out, and bring them back so that we can give those to Pastor Claude when he comes. Also, those name tags, those name badges. If you don't have one or two or three or ten of them, just call the church office. We'll make you one, two, three, or ten to scatter wherever you need to put them, to make sure, I see one of the secretaries smiling as I say that, to make sure that uh, you have some of these. Because again, as Pastor Amy said, there's only one of Claude and one of Lori and a couple thousand of you. So you'll be patient, but um, if you can give them some help with those name tags, and it helps you get to know each other. So I encourage you to uh, try to find those name tags. Now, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. This is our text for the morning. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Jesus is in the temple. People have been coming to Jesus trying to trip Jesus up. Uh, since the end of chapter 11, they've been trying to trip Jesus up, asking him questions about authority, about paying taxes, about uh, the resurrection and marriage in the resurrection. And someone comes up and says, beginning at verse 28, one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions, I bet not. Would you pray with me? God, it's so good to be here in this place together to share this precious time with one another. We know that you have called us together here in this place. You have gathered us to one another. And right now, through the power of your Spirit, you're working to gather us to you. I pray, God, that each one of us here in this place this morning will have ears to hear what you're saying to us. May we hear your word today, and may we not think that it's just a word for someone else in the pew or a word for someone that's not here, but may we realize it is a word for us, each one of us, this morning. So God, we pray that you'll speak to us. And God, if there is anyone here in this place today to whom your voice is the voice of a stranger or a voice that's seldom heard, May this be that person's day when that person experiences new, vital, vibrant life in Jesus Christ. May this be that person's day when through faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the work of Jesus Christ, that he or she can enter into the joy and the life that you have planned for them in this world and the world to come. So God, we do pray that you give us ears to hear what you're saying to us today. In the strong and saving and salvaging name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It is very, very important what we believe. 
We believe that it's important what we believe because we know that God has revealed certain beliefs to us and it's very, very important that we know those beliefs and that we believe those beliefs and that we trust those beliefs. It's also very, very important what it is we believe because what we believe determines, I really believe, and the whole tenor of Scripture is thus, it is what we believe that determines what we do. I really believe that we, act, we think our way into right actions. We don't act our way into right thinkings. I think if we can get our heads screwed on straight, our hearts firmly implanted in the will of God, our wills dedicated to God, then our actions, our practices will begin to follow suit. It's important what we believe. It's important that we allow God to give us the hardware uh, with which we live. It's important that we allow God to give us that inner voice that guides us. It is important what we believe because what we believe determines how we act, how we live. So I'm glad that you're here this morning because this is a good place for us to continue the process, to continue the journey of evaluating what it is we think about life about ourselves and each other and God. It's important what we believe. In the Christian tradition, this is why we have created what we call creeds or affirmations of faith because it's important what we believe. I invite you to take your United Methodist hymnal and turn, and this is not a rhetorical request, I really do, I want you to take your United Methodist hymnal and turn to number 880 in the back. Not page 880, but number 880 in the back. You'll notice, I hope you've noticed already, most of you, that in the back of our hymnal is a whole collection of creeds, a whole collection of affirmations of faith. I commend, by the way, our hymnal, the hymnal to you for your own private prayer, your own private devotion. You know, there was a time when all Methodists had the Methodist hymnal in their home. All Methodists had a Bible and a hymnal, and all Methodists used the Bible and their hymnal and their daily prayer and their daily private worship. But shortly after the Civil War, we got sort of sophisticated, and we started putting hymnals in the pews of our churches. So guess what happened? People quit bringing their hymnal, which eventually led to them ceasing to even have hymnals in their homes. That's why several years ago, by the way, as an aside, when we started putting Bibles in our pews, I got nervous because I'm afraid of which that might be a precursor. You know, if you have a Bible here just provided for you. I hope that you have a hymn on a Bible at home as you grow in the faith, as you continue the journey. A lot of good stuff in our hymnal, but at, at number 880, you see the beginning of our creeds. There's the Nicene Creed, the most complete creed, uh, the creed that has uh, probably the biggest place in Christian tradition. Uh, you notice in the Apostles' Creed traditional version, Apostles' Creed ecumenical version, 881, 882. I hope that you notice, and I'm sure this is old news to several of you, hope that you notice these creeds are in three paragraphs. Traditional historic creeds are always in three paragraphs. There's a paragraph for God the Father, a paragraph for God the Son, a paragraph for God the Spirit. And you notice the biggest paragraph in all these creeds these three traditional creeds, is the second paragraph, the paragraph about God the Son. Because there's a lot of people who think rightly, to a certain extent, about God the Father, you know, the supreme being, the, 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 the old man upstairs, whatever they want to call him. A lot of people think rightly about God the Father. A lot of people even have some understanding of God the Spirit, you know, the force be with you, the Spirit of God that's sort of in the world. But where people are most likely to think awry, is in regards to God the Son. What we as Christians uniquely believe about the Nazarene, what we as Christians uniquely believe about that Galilean preacher who wandered the Galilee and Judea about 2,000 years ago. That's why the, the longest paragraph in our historic creeds are the paragraphs about Jesus. Uh, so you see these three historic creeds, the Apostles' Creed is one of the ones best known to Methodists. Um, it was, it was written in the form we have it by about the 7th century after Christ. Uh, parts of it go back to the 2nd century after Christ. It doesn't really go back to the apostles, but it certainly goes back to apostolic thought. 
So most Methodists know the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, the shorter version, you see the Apostles' Creed shorter than Nicene Creed, was actually created probably for use with new converts, was created for use with baptisms. A little bit later in the service, you will notice we'll be using it this morning as we confirm uh, this, these, these young people who are professing faith in Jesus Christ, who are claiming the faith for themselves, and who are taking the vows to live as Christ followers in the world. If you continue on in your hymn, you see there's several other creeds there. There's the Statement of Faith of the United Church of Canada, 883. 884, Statement of Faith of the Korean Methodist Church. By the way, Korea uh, is a place that right now is on fire for Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that some of the Koreans now are sending missionaries to the United States because we need to somehow catch some of the fire that the Korean Christians are experiencing. 885 is a modern affirmation. 886, the World Methodist Social Affirmation. Then you notice 887, 888, 889 are all affirmations or creeds made up of words of Scripture because we know that in the Bible we find parts of the Bible that feel like and sound like uh, creeds that were used in the early Christian community. So creeds are important because what we believe is important. You notice though all of these creeds are really for us. All of these creeds are for us to help us believe what we need to believe about particularly Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. So these are the creeds that tell us how to think about Jesus. And these are so important. These are the boundaries. These are the pathways. This, the, this is the trellis upon which we grow our faith. So these creeds are very important. But these are not Jesus' creed. Um, these are creeds for us to help us believe what we need to believe about Jesus. But we need to periodically remind ourselves, what was it that Jesus believed? Because again, Jesus knew that belief ushers us into practice and lifestyle. So the text I read for a few moments ago, many of us now call that text the Jesus Creed. Uh, we borrow that phrase from uh, Scott McKnight, a great New Testament scholar of the present generation. And it does feel like Jesus' creed, because if you look at it, it sounds like a creed, and you notice he's using the creed of Judaism. So they're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to ask him which is the greatest of all commandments. And you probably know that among the Jews, they have like 613 commandments. 613 commandments they find in the Hebrew Bible. And, and every Jew throughout all of history, they have known that there's no way they can keep all 613 commandments. That there's actually a rabbinic saying that says if, they, if anyone were to ever keep all 613 commandments, perfectly Messiah would come. So Jews know, they've known for 3,000 years now, they just do the best they can with as many of them as they can. But that's why it's very important for them to know which are the more important commandments. Which are the more important commandments, which are the lesser important commandments. Several years ago when I was in Jerusalem, uh, me and an Episcopal priest friend of mine, we, we invited our tour guide, David Aarons, I many of you know David, we invited David Aarons to dinner so that we could talk politics with him because he never talks politics in the presence of the pilgrimage groups. But we wanted to talk politics with them. We, we invited him to dinner to talk about the Arab-Israeli situation, and we, we left our hotel and went to another nearby hotel and went to a restaurant, and he said he would meet us there for dinner. Well, as we're sitting there waiting on David, who is an observant Jew, it dawns on us that that was not a kosher restaurant in a kosher hotel. So when David sat down, he's a very gracious person, when David sat down, we said, we can go somewhere else. Uh, our hotel that we stay in is kosher. I said, we could go somewhere else. Uh, we weren't thinking that this was not a kosher hotel. We would invite you to here to dinner. And David said, no, don't worry about it. He's very gracious. He, he said, I'll find something to eat. And even though it was not going to come out of the kosher kitchen, he was okay. He'd find something to eat. So he looked at the menu. He ordered a salad. But then in a few moments when the salad came, guess what was sprinkled atop the salad? Bacon bits. That's when I found David's line in the sand. That's when I found a commandment that he would not transgress. The eating of pig, the eating of pork. Uh, he still was very gracious. We offered to leave at that point, and he didn't want to make us leave. So, so basically, he talked politics while we ate our supper. Um, 
but Jews throughout history, because of the 613 commandments, they've always been interested to know which of the 613 are the more important commandments. You know of the Big Ten in the commandments. Which of all the 613 are the more important, the absolutely non-negotiable commandments? That's what the person was asking Jesus that day in the temple. What is the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus, being a good Jew, starts exactly where any Jew would start, with the creed of Judaism, the Shema. The Shema. Uh, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elokeinu, Adonai Echad. That's from Deuteronomy 6. That's the creed of Judaism. To this day, every Jew, every observant, practicing Jew, tries to say the Shema every morning, tries to say the Shema every night, and they try, if at all possible, to die with the words of the Shema on their lips. And Jesus starts with the Shema because Shema, hear O Israel, is simply hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Jesus starts with the historic creed of Judaism that reminds the Jews that God is a personal God, the Lord our God, personal our God. So the creed reminds the Jewish people that God is a personal God and God is one. And then he goes on and continues to quote the book of Deuteronomy. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. Hear the fourfold repetition of all. So he's making it clear as he quotes from Deuteronomy that um, when we know who God is, the proper response is to offer the totality of our being to God. All, all. All, all. Not just a little attention given to God periodically. Not just God being one among many uh, issues or concerns in life. But God being the one that deserves the totality of our being. And that's what Jesus reminds them of when he quotes from Deuteronomy. That we should make an offering of ourselves fully and completely to God. And then in verse 31 of Mark's Gospel, chapter 12... He adds, though, and this is a little unique to Jesus for the first century. He says, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So he really gives two commandments in answer to the question, which is the greatest commandment. The reason he gives two commandments is because they're really two sides of one coin. You should love the Lord your God with everything that you are. And love your neighbor as yourself. Because the way that we love God is not by just sitting around and hoping we have some proper emotional feelings about God. The way that we love God is by loving neighbor. That's how we love God. Love for God has to be partnered with love for neighbor for it to be a valid biblical expression of love for God. Uh, Loving God is displayed in the world. Loving God is acted out in the world by the loving of our neighbor. One of the things Jesus brought to us that is rather unique um, for the first century is how Jesus defined neighbor. Up until Jesus' day, what you would usually read in Jewish literature is neighbor means another Jew or a relative. That's about as broad as they would go with their definition for neighbor. But we've read the rest of the book, haven't we? Particularly the Gospels. We know how Jesus defined neighbor. Jesus defined neighbor as anyone, anywhere, particularly anyone, anywhere who has a need. Anyone, anywhere who has a need that we can somehow help alleviate. How we can help delude the misery of this world. How we can help make gentle the life of this world. So Jesus was pretty revolutionary in the way he defined neighbor. He calls us to love neighbor, and that doesn't just mean the people who think like we think. That doesn't just mean people who live like we live. That doesn't just mean people who worship as we worship. That doesn't just mean people who live next door or my vicinity or my region or my country. Our neighbor is anyone, anywhere who has a need that we can somehow help alleviate. So Jesus brought that radically new definition for neighbor to this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. By the way, as an aside, notice Jesus says, as he quotes from Leviticus 19 here, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, You you need to have a healthy self-love before you can love your neighbor. As a matter of fact, give you a little piece of advice, won't charge you anything extra for it. If you don't love yourself, just leave your neighbor alone. 
Because chances are, if you don't have a healthy self-love, you will do harm and hurt to your neighbor. But if you have a healthy, spiritually mature self-love, then love your neighbor as yourself. So here is Jesus' creed. This is what Jesus believed. All the other creeds that we use that are so important help us know how to believe about Jesus. Help us know how to believe about God and Spirit. But this is what Jesus believed. This is Jesus' creed. This morning, we're in this place where we're going to get to watch the Spirit make disciples of Jesus Christ. We need to make sure we understand, church, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It means to be a follower of Christ, not just someone who thinks good things and appropriate things and um, very respectful things of Jesus, but a follower of Christ who follows in the way of Christ. Because to be a disciple means to be an apprentice of Jesus. We allow Jesus to teach us. The word disciple means learner. We need to be apprentices of Jesus. For a lot of the people I talk to on a pretty regular basis, they are more an apprentice of Fox News or MSNBC than they are of Jesus. As a disciple, we're called to be an apprentice of Jesus because we want to be a follower of Jesus who follows in the way of Jesus. And that also means that we seek with everything that we have to imitate Jesus. Christ in this world. The body of Christ, the church, you and I, we were God's idea in Jesus Christ. Jesus founded us. And we, the church, the people of Jesus, we are the body of Christ, we're told by the New Testament. And for better or for worse, we're the only body that Jesus now has in this world. We are the body of Christ that does the work of Jesus in this world. And that's why we're called to be the physical presence of Jesus in the world. And that's what it means to be a disciple. Someone who follows the way of Jesus and seeks to imitate Jesus in life. Jesus wants us to believe the right thing so that we'll act, live the right way. Particularly with, with regard to this ethic of love. We're to become embodiments of God's agape love for the world. God does a work within us, inside of us, so that it can go outward as we live as embodiments of God's style love, Jesus-shaped love in the world. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Those of us that are Methodist types, Wesleyan types, I'm really grateful for our heritage. Because since the earliest days of our movement, we've tried to be very clear about, and here comes an important word, you can impress your friends with it, but I'll, I'll tell you what it means. We've always been really clear about what sanctification is. Sanctification is just the process of becoming holy. The process of becoming Christ-like. The process of becoming the people God in Christ created us to be. And for us as Methodists, sanctification is tied to not feeling certain things, not abstaining from certain things, but sanctification or growth and holiness for us is all about how we treat our neighbors. John Wesley commended this text to Methodist if we want to learn the character of a Methodist. Because for us, holiness is not about saying certain words and feeling certain feelings or abstaining from certain things, but it's about how we treat our neighbor. Defining neighbor as Jesus defines neighbor. When we die and we face the judgment seat of Christ, which we all will one day, and it will not be a judgment as to whether or not we get to enter heaven. It will not be a judgment as to whether or not we get to live eternal, eternally in heaven because that's settled at the cross. That's settled because of our faith in Christ. But it will be a judgment where Christ will ask us how we live the life that was given to us. I will promise you, you will not be asked how much you know. You will be asked how well did you love? How well did you love God? And how well did you love the people that God has given you to love? Your neighbors. I said that to you my very first Sunday six years ago. 
here at Main Street Church. And I hope that you never, ever forget that.